thanks so much uh, to the Bayron team. And I did want to give a very big happy birthday to Carmelita. Um, so, so grateful for you to spend your, your special day with us um, and share your passion and all your amazing work. Um, so I'm Katie Van Dyke from the city of Berkeley's Office of Energy and Sustainable Development. Um, and one of the key goals that our office is working towards is our Berkeley City Council has a resolution to become fossil fuel free as soon as possible, which means eliminating gas um, from our buildings and our transportation systems. And so, as many of you know, the city also already has a prohibition on, on natural gas hookups in new buildings. But as we all know, um, and we, as we've been hearing, ex existing buildings are much more complicated. So I'm here today to um, discuss our draft existing buildings electrification strategy, um, which is really the culmination of about two years of work that we've been doing to determine how to equitably remove gas from our existing building stock. And before I dive in, I really just wanted to give uh, another shout out to, to the excellent work that Carmelita, you and uh, the Green Lining Institute have done, um, particularly the equitable building electrification framework, which uh, Green Lining put out. Um, we really looked to that as a guide and it really informed our, our strategy um, for how we incorporated equity and um, approached our community engagement. So just wanted to give a big thank you for, for your leadership there. Um, so first I'll provide a brief overview of the project. Um, so the scope of the project was to determine how to equitably um, electrify all of our existing buildings um, to determine how quickly we could do that um, and provide both short and long-term uh, recommended solutions. We also conducted an analysis of our existing building stock um, to inform what type of work would need to be done to our buildings and how much it would cost. Then we modeled the costs and potential savings of electrifying buildings under different conditions. And throughout all of this, we've been focused on engaging with community organizations that represent marginalized communities, in addition to some of the more traditional public um, engagement approaches. Um, our team was led by an incredible group of folks. Um, the, the project manager was Rincon Consultants. Um, we also had RMI as our technical and cost analysis lead. And then the Ecology Center uh, was, our, was our partner um, conducting the community outreach and served as our equity consultant. Um, we also received some additional support from the Building Electrification Institute and RMI. So now I'm gonna talk about the community outreach and equity guardrails that our team developed. Um, the city worked with us at the, or the city worked with um, the Ecology Center, who's a trusted partner in the community to help um, conduct some targeted community engagement and get a better understanding of the needs and concerns of the disadvantaged communities in Berkeley. And so what this means is that we focused and prioritized our time on conducting smaller one-on-one -on -one um, often conversations with community organizations that represented the marginalized communities. And this is a, you know, this is an intentional shift to meeting people in their meetings and where they're comfortable and in their spaces, as opposed to kind of the more, as we um, call traditional model of community outreach, where cities just invite people to a large public meeting and these can have lots of barriers to participation for folks. So we also did some of these traditional outreach efforts as well, and I'll talk about that too. But really one of the primary goals of this targeted outreach was to listen and learn and to start building trust and relationships with these communities. So the way we did this was the Ecology Center served as the initial liaison. And if and when that community organization was comfortable having the city in the room, then we would join in and kind of start having that conversation together. So an example of this, um, type of targeted engagement is that our office and the Ecology Center applied for and received a grant from USDN to do some targeted outreach with um, on electrification with Green the Church, Church by the Side of the Road, and the Berkeley Black Ecumenical Ministerial Alliance, and these represent several Black churches in Berkeley. And so we met with them virtually during, it was all during COVID, um, at their convenings. Um, so, and there we discussed building electrification and we did a train the trainer session so that it would build capacity for the members of those congregations to teach the members of their community about electrification. At these meetings, we asked attendees for input on what their priorities were generally. And so this is the result of one of those polls and you can see a pretty widespread distribution of priorities with the top one being housing affordability and climate change being only 17% of the group's priority. The next slide compares the results of that poll at the Green the Church meeting, here seen in green, to the results to the same question which we posed at our larger general public meeting. And as you can see, the priorities come in very, very different. So the folks who came to the large public meeting had 
clearly a higher interest in climate change, over 70%, um, than the folks who were at the Green the Church meeting. And so this is just an important reminder as to why it is so important to do this targeted outreach, um, which with marginalized communities who are not always represented in these larger forums um, and some of the limitations of the existing ways that we, we do outreach traditionally. Another example of a traditional outreach uh, approach that we did was we did a community survey. And as I'm sure is in the case with other jurisdictions, when we look at the demographics of who actually responded to our survey, um, it's compared to the actual demographics of the city, um, this shows a skewing of respondents being generally wider, older homeowners than the rest of the community. And so it's not to say that the feedback from these members and the, the people who are coming to the other meetings is not important, um, but we just have to remember that when we're evaluating results of a survey or taking input at a large public meeting, um, this, this is from a subsection of the larger community and it doesn't always account for the feedback of those who may have been um, burdened the most and um, who generally stand to bear the highest impacts of climate change first and worst. So in order to make sure that we hear those voices, we really need to make sure that we're making the effort um, to seek them out. And so while we were doing this targeted outreach, our team was also doing a cost analysis with an equity lens. And so one important takeaway that I just wanted to share is that um, in the costing analysis, we found that Berkeley's widest neighborhoods um, will have a lower cost of electrification generally than the neighborhoods that have more diversity. Um, it was about $7,000 a home in the wider neighborhoods and about 9,000 in the more diverse neighborhoods. And this is largely a result of the fact that we found that electrification was less cost effective in multifamily homes in Berkeley. Um, and so it's, it's just something to make sure that um, we wanted to highlight that it's important to put the same level of effort into quantifying the equity impacts of decarbonization, um, that we are into quantifying costs or quant quantifying um, costs and energy um, and carbon reductions. Um, it's, it's just a very important thing to make sure that you're highlighting. So as a result of the targeted outreach we did, this slide shows some of the feedback that we heard. And um, so I'll go through this a little quickly, um, but just one thing we heard loud and clear is that we need, to, we need to protect renters from potential displacement. Um, costs are a big concern. People couldn't afford even a slight increase in bills or a slight increase in switching on appliances. Um, that was just not, not an acceptable approach. Um, and things that we were hearing from the previous panel. People have other priorities for their buildings, right? There are health and safety issues that need to be addressed first. Um, and it shouldn't, you know, electrification on its own was not something that was a high priority. Um, and people were, we also did hear that people were concerned about PSPS events and um, losing the redundancy of having a gas system in their house. A couple more minutes. Thank you, Katie. Okay, great. And so based on this, we, um, we showed that, you know, based on the community input and on the costing that we, we found that, you know, electrification, electrification still is expensive for many. We developed what we are calling um, equity guardrails, which really serve as a set of minimum requirements that any policies have to address in order to move forward and be mandated. So they are, um, the first is access to health and safety benefits, making sure everyone has access to the benefits of electrification. Um, the second is access to economic benefits, which includes um, having access to high road job opportunities associated with electrification. The third is maximizing ease of installation, um, making sure that we understand that easy looks different to different people depending on what their needs are. So our programs need to address that. Um, and then the fourth is promoting housing affordability and anti-displacement. So making sure that we don't make this housing crisis worse um, and making sure that we're talking to folks to make sure that we can try to make it better where possible. And finally, um, so we have our draft strategy and this, is, this graphic represents it. So we have four potential policy triggers that cities can pull. Their time of replacement and renovation, time of sale, building performance standards, and neighborhood electrification and natural gas pruning. And in order for any of these to be successful, we think we need to approach all of these. Um, but to be successful, we need to, we need to have strong pillars of education, accessible funding and financing, and regulatory changes. And then finally, the whole strategy is really founded in equity and the equity guardrails as the foundation. Um, and so this is the approach that we're taking and we have it as a phased approach. So um, really kind of starting to lay the groundwork for the next few years 
um, and then not implementing any of those strategies until we're able to pass those equity guardrails, which is what phase two would be. And then phase three would be completing the transition no later than 2045. So um, really quickly, we are trying to finalize this report um, in the fall, and then we'll be uh, working for implementation. And I won't go over this slide, but we, we get questions a lot around kind of what can cities use from our strategy and what are good places for other cities to start. And so I'll leave this slide um, in our and to be uh, released with, with all the other slides. And um, if anyone has questions, I'm happy to chat about that after.